I share that because I think imposter syndrome is an extension of white supremacy and patriarchy. And so that's the work that has to happen internally for us to dismantle that and disengage from that toxic narrative and be able to to rewrite our story. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Campfire Circle. I'm your host, Tanya Bhattacharya, and I empower purpose-driven women in building influential personal brands that drive change and raise revenue. We all talk about getting a seat at the table, but why though? Who wants to sit in a stuffy boardroom anyway? Let's reimagine the ultimate space of leadership as a campfire circle, where we share stories that inspire movements, build brave communities to huddle together with for warmth, and where there is always room. Come sit with us. All right, so today we're here with Dr. Devana stallmaker Schaffner, who's an associate professor at Antioch University, New England, and associate chair of the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Department. She's also a licensed professional counselor in the state of Georgia, as well as a national certified counselor. And she's been in professional practice as a counselor for over 20 years. And her experience includes individual, group, marriage and family counseling to clients presenting with treatment concerns like depression, anxiety, trauma, as well as substance use, addiction, and recovery. And so I cannot wait to dig deep and chat with you today. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Tanya. I'm so excited to be a part of this. Yeah, I mean, this is going to get deep. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. So let's let's kind of start in the beginning. I'd love for you to share about your story. You know, what did you grow through to get here? Whew. Okay, so that is always one of those hard questions. Tell me your story. Um, quite honestly, how I came to be a counselor came from my own personal experience. Um, when I was 17, I was sexually assaulted and I went through a number of things as any, um, survivor would. So I went through the typical trauma reactions of isolation, um, irritability, um, depression, and a number of other things. And so I was fortunate enough to have a counselor who was compassionate, understanding, supportive, nurturing, and helped me through that really difficult time. And I started doing um, some volunteer work at the um, Young Women's Christian Association, YWCA um, Rape Crisis Center. So I was doing uh, public speaking events. I was doing um, volunteer counseling. And then I realized I kind of like this counseling thing. (laughs) And so I switched my major from English to psychology. And uh, the rest is, as they say, is history. So from there, went into um, uh, went into my master's program and uh, got my master's in mental health, um, clinical mental health counseling. And then several years later, went back for my doctorate in counselor education and supervision. And so now I am a practitioner and a scholar and um, and an educator. So that's my story. You are, yes, you are. And you do all of those things beautifully. I, before I ask my next question, I want to ask you, what did you love about it? Because it sounds like maybe there was a defining moment or or something that really opened your eyes because you were an English major and then you switched. And so did I. I also switched into becoming <laughs> a psychology major. So I'm curious, what, what did you love so much about it? Um. I say this and I I know it kind of sounds cheesy, but counseling for me feels as natural as breathing. It feels like um, an extension of who I am as a person. Um, I am empathic. Um, I am um, compassionate and caring and nurturing and um, supportive. And all of those things are necessary skills in counseling. So it, it just felt organically me. And that's how I ended up um, as a counselor. I had considered um, psychiatry because I uh, was a biology, um, I was a double major, psychology and biology. And then I realized psychiatrists don't do the fun stuff, like the counseling. They prescribe medications and they're all about diagnostic work and assessments. And I wanted to be in the trenches. I wanted to 
work with people and help them through their their difficult and dark moments and come out on the other side of that because I did it. And so I wanted to be able to help other people to do the exact same thing. That's amazing. I think the most successful fill in the blank, counselors, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, whatever the title is, the most successful ones, I think, have that lived experience and have gone through the journey uh, and have gotten to the other side because they have the wisdom, right? They have the lived experience. They have the, yeah. the, the everything to be able to pass on to the people that they're helping. And, Absolutely. and what a great sign that you were able to, to finally feel like you were most yourself. I think that's a huge sign that we're in the right role at the right time. Well, um, I was kind of worried about this counseling thing because I remember in my master's program, in my very first class, my professor um, said, if you're here to make money, you can leave now <laughs> because this <laughs> is not a profession where you're going to get rich. And I, I thought, there are other ways to be fulfilled and to be enriched. And I remember my mom um, saying that do what you love and the money will come. And so far I'm living okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not like balling out of control, but I'm, I'm comfortable. <laughs> and I bet your heart is fulfilled every single day you wake up, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> every day I know that I'm living my purpose and how many people can say that? So Kind of related. So you, so in your three roles, right, you're a counselor, you're a clinical supervisor, you're a professor, you're mm-hmm. also a speaker. So in all these four roles, I think you have a really unique opportunity to nurture people who have that lived experience in that, in that fill in the blank issue, you know, mental health, systemic mm-hmm. racism, all of the intersectional isms. And so you have that opportunity to nurture them into a change maker like you who's actively doing something to fix that big problem that they went through. And that's a beautiful thing because then that next cohort of human beings are able to hopefully have a different experience. They don't have to, they maybe have more services, they have more care available, or they just don't have to go through that same experience. So uh, let me stop my my ramble and just long question short. (laughs) Um, How do you best nurture up future social change agents? Wow, that's a great question. And I think one of the things that I would probably want to say or focus on is really helping them to develop a level of of social consciousness. And part of that is helping them to really think about their own work. What have they done? So before you can give to the community, you have to do your own work, I believe, very deeply in being an actualized person and um, fulfilling um, the things that you need to do in order to be able to help someone on their journey. So I think part of what I would do is encourage um, anyone to do their work around social justice and activism and advocacy. Um, And then um, what does that look like for them? So that could be um, going to different lectures, could be listening to podcasts, it could be reading books, it could be attending workshops and seminars. Um, it's it's really very open-ended, all the things that you can do. I think the point is that you're searching for knowledge, you're searching for awareness, and you're searching for your purpose. And so one of the other things I, I tell my students um, is really to kind of think about the five W's, and that's really simple. So who am I and who are you wanting to become? Um, and why do you, I'm not, well, I went, to, I jumped ahead. So who am I wanting to become as an advocate? I think that's a better way of, of phrasing it. And then the what would be, what is your purpose? Why, what, what is leading you or driving you to do this work? And then when will you begin the work? So give yourself a time frame. Um, be able to, to do some of your, um, your own reflection and your own growth. And then how will that be channeled into activism and advocacy? And then where do you need to start? So do you need to start with yourself? Do you need to start with your clients? Do you need to start with your family? Do you need to start in your community? Um, so where does the work need to happen? And then lastly, and I think the most salient question is why is this work important to you? Um, sometimes I 
I, I've come across people who haven't figured out not necessarily who they are, but but why they are. I guess I know that doesn't sound very grammatically correct, but why they are the person they are and who are they wanting to be and finding a way to live your truth and live authentically. Um, I think that's probably one of the most challenging aspects of being a human. If you can answer that question, I think that will help guide you um, as you start to do the work for other people through advocacy and, um, and activism. Yes. <laughs> There's so much I want to unpack there. Before I can get into the question, something that came up for me is this quote that my friend Jessica turned me on to and I love, and it's a bell hooks quote. Mm, I love bell hooks. <laughs> yes. Yes. And the quote I'm paraphrasing, but it's something like the most important type of activism is our mental health. Because if you feel like you can't change anything about your reality, how are you going to change the world? And it goes on. But the the part of the quote I love the most is if you're fucked up and lead the revolution, you're going to have a pretty fucked up revolution. (laughs) (laughs) And who could say it more eloquently than bell hooks? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's, I mean, that's perfect because it, it really is like the blind leading the blind. If you have no sense of purpose, if you have no direction, if you have no focus, no goal, no drive, whatever, then you have no real meaningful contribution. And that's why you have to do your work in order to to tap into those things that are essentials um, you to do the work and to keep you focused and grounded because this work is hard. It's challenging. There are lots of disappointments. There are lots of frustrations and setbacks. Um, think about just recently with the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict and how that was a setback. And then um, fast forward a week and we have the McMichaels and their accomplice co-conspirator, I forget his name right now, um, but they had a had guilty verdicts um, in the death of Ahmaud Aubrey. And I, I think those are the things that have to keep you going is when you have those setbacks to remember the purpose, to remember your focus, and that the mission is bigger than just one one moment in time. That's so important. It's the, it's the vision, it's the mission, it's the, it's the why, it's the how, but it's also the who. And I and I love that you talked about the importance of the, the who am I wanting to become? Mm-hmm. Um, because I think if we are so focus on this goal, this, this thing we want to accomplish, but we, again, haven't done the things to become the person we need to be to affect those changes. Uh, we're just going to get disappointed. And so, you know, and I know you're, you're talking about students, you're talking about the folks that you work with, but I have even noted really, um, people in leadership who haven't necessarily done this work around that foundational, you know, why, what is my purpose? Why am I doing this? Who do I need to become? Uh, how can I best get it done? Right. Um, and, and that's not because they don't want to, but we gloss over these big strategic questions because the day-to-day gets in the way, but this really is that foundation for activating that movement. Exactly. And when I think about people in leadership, um, I think about the, the importance of a servant leader and being able to minister to to your group to your um to the people who look up to you and to work with them and have them working with you in this very collaborative um way where you're not exercising dominion over anyone but you're working in concert and creating the reality that you want to see in your organization so i think that's something that people miss the mark on, that they're so busy focus, being focused on um, being in charge that they do not lead the charge. Really powerful. And I think that we have really grown up in seeing models of that hierarchical leadership. We think that's just what a leader is. We think it's that leader who like slaps their fist on the boardroom table and is, you know, uh, kind of larger than life. But to me, I think the strongest most effective leaders were really those community-based folks who were just in right relation with everyone around them. And as a result, it created that ripple effect that really affected a movement. Exactly. And I think part of that mentality, um, that antiquated mentality around leadership comes from 
the system and culture of white supremacy and patriarchy, that these are the things that are important within that system, that you have power and control and that you exercise that um, in a full-throated way where there is, the, and being unapologetic. That's where I want people to begin to understand that that is not a successful or a sustainable model of leadership, that you have to work in concert with the people who are under your charge um, to be able to, to accomplish the mission that, that is set forth before you in your organization, in your workplace, wherever you are and wherever you have an opportunity to lead and serve. So that's really powerful because you're right. I think we are all really swimming in these white supremacy characteristics and we don't even know, we don't, not all of us even know it. Right. And so, right. and it just becomes our, our society's version of success are these antiquated things that we see. And, but I think there's things that we can do as we're swimming in this water to realize, oh, there's a ladder right in front of us. Let me get out of this pool. Let get me out of this pool. So let's talk about those kinds of things because you are an incredible clinician and you and I actually met at the West Coast Symposium on Addictive Disorders where you were giving a keynote presentation and you were talking about culturally sensitive approaches for treatment. And so a narrative therapy is one of those approaches. So of course my ears perked up (laughs) and I would love for you to tell us like what is narrative therapy and why is it helpful? So Narrative therapy is um, um, a form of psychotherapy, and it really is working with a um, a client or patient um, to help them to identify what their values are and to really help them to hone in on the skills that are associated with those values. So it's really a a way of helping um, clients to understand who they are and what they bring to the table, so to speak. Um, It's it's a way to help them to really look at their their current problems um, in a more holistic way and in a deconstructed way, if that makes sense. So narrative therapy also is a, is a very, I would say, socially just approach to therapy because it really does seek to dismantle the dominant narrative and help the, the client to be able to understand their personal narrative, their personal story, and how those stories can lead to their own empowerment. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's amazing. And I, I shared with you, I'll share with the kind of the audience that, um, you know, I worked in addiction treatment for many years. And one of the things I got to do is sit with a lot of the women that uh, we served and help them write the recovery story. And it started mm-hmm. off as trying to, you know, like have testimonials and stuff, but it really evolved into something deeper and really beautiful and really generative because once you, because of course the initial story was really rooted in shame, um, Mm -hmm. not enoughness, I'm an awful mom, all of those kinds of things. But over this work, we got to reframe that story in one that was really rooted in power, resilience, courage, breaking generational cycles. And so as a result, they really were able to relate to themselves differently. And as a result of that, they were able to relate to everybody else differently and advocate for themselves differently. Hey, if anything you're hearing today inspires you to get more visible as a go-to trusted voice for your audience and drive change towards your deeper mission, I've got something for you. LinkedIn is my favorite place to share my stories and build relationships with my co-conspirators and brand new friends. So I put together a free resource with 14 prompts to create your next post on LinkedIn. Take all the guesswork out of what to say and just start building your impact and influence. Be sure to tag me in your post so I can come by, cheer you on and amplify your message. You can find those free prompts in the show notes. Okay, back to the episode. What's coming up for me is that language is super generative, like it creates our reality. I think that one of the things that I've I've talked to clients about is uh, when we talk about their narrative that often, like you were saying, that they think of themselves through a shame-based lens and they're often an actor in their narrative. And what I'm trying to do with narrative therapy and through working with them 
is to help them to not be an actor because actors are powerless. They they just do the role that's given to them. The, the power, the real power is in the story, in the storytelling and in the direction of the story. So being the author of of their, their narrative, the director of their lives. So it comes from a more empowered place as opposed to feeling that something is happening to you and that you are without any control or agency. And it gives us back that distinction of choice. It puts yes. the power back in. Yes, yes, I love it. I love it. And, you know, whether this work is kind of more in a mental health setting or in sort of like the business entrepreneurship mindset setting, it's all the same. It's like these self-limiting stories that we carry around with ourselves because we keep telling ourselves the same story without yes. breaking it up, without without remembering that we have choice. And one of the big scary stories that I encounter a lot in my clients, my friends, my business besties, the people I do life with is this thing that people call imposter syndrome. Mm. <laughs> and I'd love to get your read on how we can use narrative therapy kind of tools or, or practices to reframe that story. Ooh, you, you touched on something because I surprisingly struggle with it myself. I, I, I don't remember that being an issue earlier in my career. I think it was something that happened after... Um, I graduated with my doctorate and started teaching that there was this sense that I needed to be more than what I was and that what I was wasn't good enough. So I I really understand the the imposter syndrome. And I think part of what I have been trying to do with myself is really understanding my identity and my purpose and focusing on how I can be more of an active participant and, and reshape the story. So instead of telling myself that I'm not worthy of the opportunity to speak in front of people or that I'm not worthy of a publication, to be able to say that this is part of my journey, that this is part of my growth, and this is an opportunity for me to give and to serve in a meaningful way. Instead of thinking about how I may not measure up, think about the contribution that I'm making from my own experiences. So I think narrative therapy and helping people to reauthor their story, uh, which is an intervention um, that is used in, um, in narrative therapy, is that it helps them to really figure out who, who they are and what their identity is and find power in that narrative and being able to understand what's important to them and what is most meaningful about their journey and to live in the positive, the things that help to make them who they are as opposed to the things that they're not, to focus on the things that they are. That's a revolutionary thing because society, white, this white supremacy culture tells us systematically that we aren't enough, that we, that we yes. aren't smart enough. And so by taking this narrative into our own hands, that really is a revolutionary practice. I think, and you hit something for me that just kind of clicked in my mind is that the imposter syndrome didn't happen for me until I started teaching at a predominantly white institution. And mm. so being steeped in that white supremacist, patriarchal, um, antiquated thinking, feeling like I was mismatched cog in the system that, you know, one of these things is not like the other and doesn't fit instead of thinking of myself as inadequate, what I need to do and what I have been working on is thinking about the importance of my presence and the significance of my contributions, this mantle and this world, this system that is so oppressive in so many different aspects of our lives, whether it's education, whether it's um, finance, a finance and business, whether it's social issues or societal issues or criminal justice, let's say carceral systems, because there's no real justice in the criminal justice system. And that's a whole other conversation that we can go down that rabbit hole maybe another time. But um, just thinking about how, how being a part of that system has impacted me. And I think about Ibram Kendi's work, um, how to be an anti-racist. And one of the things that stuck out, stuck out for me in that, in that 
that book was that we are all indoctrinated with white supremacy and patriarchy. And that's why we have to do the work to dismantle it within ourselves first before we can dismantle it within the system. So I think I I share that because I think imposter syndrome is an extension of white supremacy and patriarchy. And so that's the work that has to happen internally for us to dismantle that and disengage from that toxic narrative and be able to, um, to rewrite our story with us in and in a more empowered position. So I want to ask you kind of a more tactical question because some of the folks listening, I'm just projecting here, but I'm, I'm thinking are, let's say it's, it's a fundraiser that's getting ready to walk into a, uh, a foundation that resembles more of a plantation than anything else that is steeped in white supremacy, you know, Mm -hmm. practices of giving, or maybe it is a entrepreneur getting ready to ask for what they're worth and this and these these principles have just seeped into them. They have imposter phenomenon. I mean, you know, I could go on with all of these examples that I just mm-hmm. am surrounded with. But I want to ask you, like, what can we actually, what are what is a tool or a practice that we could do today to help us start to dismantle or I actually like to use the word metabolize, metabolize this stuff. There is um, a, an intervention called remembering practice. And what that really is and what it speaks to is that it helps you to really identify your identity. (laughs) I know that sounded a little redundant as I said it, but that your identity and your purpose is an extension of the achievements, the social achievements, the, the purpose that you have, and that remembering allows you to draw closer to yourself. So I think one of the things that I actually like about what you mentioned earlier was having someone to write their story. So write your story as it is, as you see it currently, and then write your story as you want to see it, as you believe it needs to be or that you want it to be. So one is a story about who you are, and then the other is the story about who you're becoming. And then what are the practical steps that you need to take in order to become the person that you wrote about? And people surprisingly find that they have the skills that they need. They just lack the belief that they can do this, this work, whatever the work is. And so I think that's a really significant way of dismantling imposter syndrome from within. Great. That's great. I can see that as being so useful when somebody is, you know, thinking about applying for a job that they feel like they're not qualified for, putting their mm-hmm. hat in the ring for a big keynote presentation. It's like, that's a great practice. And I think that would actually be a great practice to do in partnership, like maybe with somebody who you trust, a colleague, because mm-hmm. sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, we need somebody, or at least for me, I'll speak for myself, it's helpful to have somebody else reflected back. So it's not yes. just my stinking thinking going on. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That totally makes sense. And I I have um, a colleague, more than a colleague, she's a friend and a mentor. And one of the things that she helped me to do was to get out of my own way when it came to seeking rank promotion and tenure um, at my university. And I didn't think I was ready. I didn't think I had enough. I didn't think I had done enough. And she said, I want you to sit down and write out everything that you've done. So look at your Vita, think about all the things that you've done over the past six years. When you do that, you will see that you are enough and that you have enough. And she was right. I didn't realize all of the the work that I have been doing, all of the contributions that I have made. I kept thinking about, oh, I need to be more. I need to do more. I need to give more from this, this perspective of, you know, this antiquated thinking, the stinking thinking like you were talking about and how I needed to get out of my own way. And part of that was being able to immerse myself in my accomplishments and understanding that I did have them and that I was worthy. Um, Because sometimes we talk ourselves out of blessings that are meant for us. No, don't we? We do. And that breaks my heart. Oh, this is such a good exercise. So I do something similar to what you shared with some of the people that I work with. And I, and I found that it's helpful to almost break that list down into kind of three categories. Mm -hmm. One is like all the things that you're passionate about, the things that you could just, you know, you don't even need to prepare. You're just, you just come on, you come onto a stage and do a whole keynote presentation because you're so passionate about it. 
Yeah. Um, the second kind of bucket is the things that make you credible. And I think for me, it's not just about your degree. It's about, or like where you went to school, it's about your lived experience, right? It's your lived experience. And then the third bucket is expertise. So what do people come to you for advice on? What do your friends say that you're the best person they know at this thing? So yeah, I, I encourage everybody listening to make that list for themselves, whether whether you think you need to or not, you know, it's a, it's a fun afternoon activity. <laughs> it is. And it will, it will reveal to you that you're more worthy than you think you are. So as we begin to wrap up, I love asking everybody on this podcast this question. So earlier we talked about the importance of going inward and really identifying our why. So like, what is your why? What is your big, beautiful vision for the world you're trying to create? Oh, um, I think what's important to me is equity and justice, um, particularly around access to mental health services. So I I think like African-Americans or Black identifying persons make up 13% of the U.S. population and probably a little bit more, but I, that's the number that kind of rings. It's like around um, 50 million or 50 million plus, um, but not to get stuck in details, but they make up a smaller percentage of the U.S. population and they're 20% more likely to have issues related to chronic mental health conditions like depression, like anxiety disorders, like substance use. And some of the contributing factors to that have to do with intergenerational and historical racial trauma. So the the thing that I want to do is level the playing field so that people who are normally, not normally, who are traditionally uh, marginalized and disenfranchised have access to services and that they are able to find their wholeness, to find their wellness, and to be able to um, to find their tribe and their community that will sh- hold them and shore them up in those moments when things feel like they're about to fall apart. So my big, beautiful vision for the world is, is equity and justice around social um, services like mental health counseling um, and being able to provide those services myself. So I'm also a practitioner. I have a private practice and I have clients that are self-pay and they actually make it easier for me to do pro bono work because that cost is offset for someone who may not be able to afford services. So I, I think that there are very concrete ways that we can effectuate change. Um, but we have to be willing to do the work and we have to be willing to see past the, the barriers and the obstacles um, and, and, and move in a direction that will allow us to, to manifest the, the vision that we have. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> well, I am, I'm so on your team. I mean, I'm with, I'm with you. Let's make this vision happen together. You know, you know, I'm equally passionate about this. So I love it. I love it. So how can our listeners reach out to you? How can they stay in touch with you? How can they stay in the loop of what you're up to? Oh, well, I think probably the easiest way to find out what I'm doing is to check out my university profile at Antioch University, New England. Um, You can go to the website and you can look under clinical mental health counseling um, department and you'll find um, my bio there and my updated Vita. Um, I also... Um, have a profile on psychology today. Um, if you just put my name in in um, psychology today, it'll pop right up. But if you're interested in what I'm doing, I like direct contact. So reach out to me. So my email address is D S T A L N A K E R Schaffner S H O F N E R at Antioch A N T I O C H dot E D U. And shoot me an email and I would love to have a conversation with anyone who is interested in doing the work and um, interested in the work that I'm doing. Love it. And we'll put those in the show notes as well so people can reach right out. I loved this conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your expertise, your passion with us. We are all better because of it. 
And I can't wait to see all you'll accomplish in 2022 and beyond. Me too. I I have a book that I'm working on that will probably come out toward the end of 2022. So that's been keeping me quite busy. But I, I, I think 2022 is going to be an amazing year for many of us. And hopefully we come out of on the other end of this pandemic and we get back to some semblance of normalcy and be able to get out there and, and do something meaningful and contribute to the greater good. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much. Thank you. What'd you think? Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or even better, reach out and let me know through lumosmarketing.co. Yes, that's lumos as in the illumination spell from Harry Potter. Because when you shine, magical things happen. You can get social with me on LinkedIn. And of course, check out the show notes to stay in touch with our guests. Let's talk soon.